There's been a very interesting trend globally in the last few years. Argentina, this was a political earthquake. Javier Millet won by a wider than expected margin, and his victory sent a clear message. Argentinians wanted change. With Giorgia Maloney to become Italy's first female prime minister and its first far-right leader since Benito Mussolini. With her brothers of Italy leading a right-wing coalition to a majority in both houses of parliament, Maloney is on track to become Italy's next prime minister. South Korea has a new president. Conservative opposition candidate Yoon suk yeol was elected in one of the most closely fought races in recent history, which will shape Asia's fourth largest economy for the next five years. Smiling and seemingly at ease for the selfies, but Sanna Marin's political star has fallen. Finland's prime minister gathered with supporters at her election headquarters as ballot results came in and showed her social democrats slipping behind the right-wing national coalition party and the Finns party. Some observers have simply chalked this up to a rise of hateful right-wing ideologies across the world. But is it that simple? Is it just a rise of a hateful ideology? Or is it a response to something else? You're seeing behind me is one of multiple locations that have been burning in Kenosha, Wisconsin over the course of the night, a second night since Jacob Blake was seen shot in the back seven times. At Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. At Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. Would you like to hear the answer or not? No! no. no. Are you okay. kidding me? This is the video viewed by millions that put Evergreen State and Weinstein in the national spotlight. This is not a discussion. You have lost that one. We will never stop calling. We will never stop striving until the black flag of Islam is all over the world. Allah is the best of planets. Islam, would we want Sharia in the UK? We want Sharia for everybody. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at the rise of these so-called right-wing parties around the world. What's the reason for it and why this trend might not slow down anytime soon. If you aren't a Gen Z and you remember a world before Instagram shorts, TikTok dance challenges, and every single millennial YouTuber like me tried to pander to the under 25 crowd, you may remember a world where people voted for primarily center-left parties. Especially in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, this was the status quo. But if you look at that graph, slowly this trend started declining. See, in the mid 20th century, center-left parties gained a lot of traction because as opposed to the conservative parties, these were the parties that talked about social progress. Particularly in the West, issues such as civil rights, gender equality, LGBTQ rights. In India, these center-left parties talked about reforming patriarchal practices such as the patriarchal Hindu laws in Indian societies. Particularly in Western countries, there was a realization of the wrongs that had happened in the past in the form of colonization, slavery, and centuries of racial discrimination in European societies. Slavery, the treatment of human beings as property deprived of personal rights. The Atlantic slave trade, occurring from the late 15th to the mid 19th century and spanning three continents, forcibly brought more than 10 million Africans to the Americas. The Seminole tribes refused to leave their land. The US military came in, another war killing thousands, forcing the tribes to sign a treaty and pushing them into the swampy interior of the state. Over the course of almost 100 years, the United States signed 368 treaties with tribal nations. When the American Civil War ends, the U.S. government enters Reconstruction with three amendments to the Constitution. Slavery is abolished, and former slaves are granted citizenship. Under the separate but equal clause, the U.S. Supreme Court legitimizes segregation and social discrimination treating black people as second-class citizens. Did you know that black women in America didn't fully have the right to vote until 1965? The center-left parties talked about 
fixing these problems. At this appeal to voters who were concerned about many of these issues, the center-left also gained prominence because leaders like Bill Clinton emerged who sought to find a middle ground between the liberals and the conservatives. The opposition to the Iraq war in the early 2000s, particularly in Europe, led to increasing support for left-leaning parties that were critical of military interventions in foreign countries and advocated for diplomatic solutions. For example, the Iraq war. Half of Iraq's people live either way up here, where they don't like Saddam, they're Kurds, they've been brutalized by Saddam, they do not like him, or they live way down here in the south. We could easily come into Iraq and take both of these big population centers. And in doing so, says Paul Wolfowitz, we could naturally take the major oil fields in Iraq, thus cutting off Saddam from his main revenue source. Even Family Guy back then knew what was going on. Ground zero. So this is where the first guy got AIDS. Peter, this is the site of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Oh, so Saddam Hussein did this? No. The Iraqi army? No. Some guys from Iraq? No. That one lady who visited Iraq that one time? No, Peter, Iraq had nothing to do with this. It was a bunch of Saudi Arabians, Lebanese, and Egyptians financed by a Saudi Arabian guy living in Afghanistan and sheltered by Pakistanis. So you're saying we need to invade Iran? But as these parties became more and more successful, a rot set in. While they were fighting right-wing discrimination, they started a discrimination of their own. In India, this looked like how the word secular socialist was forcibly inserted into the Indian preamble. How Hindu court bill was reformed, but there was no attempt to reform the Islamic or the Christian court bill in India. There was a concerted attempt to provide equal rights to Hindu women, but Muslim women like Shah Bano across India were ignored in the name of secularism, minority rights, and appeasement politics. People might remember that Shah Bano was a Muslim woman who had filed for maintenance after her husband had arbitrarily divorced her in keeping with the Sharia laws. These kinds of Sharia laws had been banned even in deeply Islamist societies like Pakistan, but they continued in India and the Indian government openly supported them instead of supporting women's rights because of the same appeasement politics. In 1998, the Canadian Multiculturalism Act was adopted by the parliament. Similar laws were passed in the UK. From 1975 to 1979, Australians also implemented similar policies. Under such regimes, European countries saw a massive spike in immigration. The left in America increasingly started supporting open border policies. As you can see, the undocumented population in America has doubled in the United States since 1994. So what are are some important factors that led to the shift from the dominance of the center-left parties towards the rise of the so-called right-wing parties today? Well, in India and overseas, one big factor was economic. The early to mid 2010s saw some significant economic slowdowns across the world. If you look at countries like the United States, Canada, even many countries in Europe, living in housing costs have gone up so high that many millennials or younger people believe that they will never be able to buy a house. A Canadian survey found that 40% of Canadians blame the federal government for the cost of living and housing crisis in the country. The annual inflation rate in the United States has increased from 3.2% in 2011 to 8.3% in 2022. Food prices went up nearly 11% for a year ended April 2022, which was the largest 12-month increase since November 1980. Argentina was one of the world's richest countries, but today about 40% of Argentinians are living in poverty and the economy is barreling towards hyperinflation and recession. The second aspect is changing demographics and massive immigration. In the United States, since Biden took off, the US Customs and Border Protection Service has logged more than 5.4 million illegal border crossings, plus at least 1.5 million go-to-ways. That is, border crossers who were detected by CBP technology but who were never apprehended at all. Around 300,000 unaccompanied children have been encountered at the border and then placed with sponsors inside the United States. Border authorities encountered more than 225,000 migrants along the US-Mexico border in December 2023, marking the highest total monthly recorded since the year 2000. So at a time where the native population of Europe is declining. The white population of America is declining. This has been coupled with massive immigration into these countries, particularly from Muslim countries. As of August 2023, France's Muslim population was around 6 million, which is about 8 to 9 percent of the country's population. Projections indicate that the Muslim population will increase by 17 percent annually. According to Pew Research, at current rates of growth, the Muslim population in Europe will be nearly 15 percent in 2050. Experts say that conversions to Islam have doubled in the past 25 years in France, with about 100,000 converts among the 6 million Muslims in France. According to a 2021 census, the Muslim population in the UK 
has grown by 44% over the last decade. In 2021, the Muslim population was 3.9 million or 6.5% of the population. In 2011, the Muslim population was 4.9% or 2.7 million people. In comparison, between 2001 and 2021, the ethnic British population fell by about 1.2 million people. Even Angela Merkel, who was at the forefront of the multiculturalism movement in Europe and inviting millions of refugees into Europe, later admitted that this was a big mistake and that the multicultural experiment is failing. So why did she have to come out and admit that? Well, simply put, there are many cultures that immigrate to European countries and America. A vast majority of those cultures are able to assimilate into European and American culture quite seamlessly. However, there is one culture that seems to have more of an issue integrating than other cultures, and that culture is Islamic culture. Now, this isn't to say that every single Muslim does not want to assimilate in European culture, but the fact is that Islamism is a big hindrance in assimilation in these societies. In Denmark, the prison management said that immigrant criminals are difficult to manage. They said 30% of the inmates are non-Danish, while the immigrant population in Denmark is only around 8%. Similar trends were seen in the UK, while the Muslim population was around 4% of the population, they contributed to around nearly 20% of the inmates in jail. Even in Sweden, the migrant population was overrepresented in sexual crimes by a factor of 2.4. While around 20% of the Swedish population were foreign born, but they were nearly 50% of the people when it came to the perpetration of sexual assault. According to Brookings report, Sweden was one of the top countries in terms of taking in immigrants after the ISIS crisis in the mid-2010s. And it doesn't just end there. There's also a crisis of rampant Islamic conversions within the prisons themselves. In Germany, cases of mass harassments were seen, many of which were identified to be the same Arab immigrants. The violence in Berlin came nearly one year after another crime that inflamed tensions between Germans and the growing population of refugees there the mass sexual assault of 1,200 women on New Year's Eve by as many as 2,000 men. The attack had huge political consequences over the year that followed. One of the most infamous cases has obviously been the cases of the grooming gangs in the UK. What are these grooming gangs? A grooming gang in the United Kingdom refers to a group of people who sexually exploit and abuse vulnerable children through coercion and intimidation. These gangs typically operate in communities with high proportion of vulnerable children, such as those in care or from disadvantaged backgrounds. Home Secretary Suela Braverman made several comments about the ethnicity of abusers in high-profile gangs, saying that almost all are British Pakistanis. So is it British Pakistanis who are sexually exploiting children? Let's look at the evidence. In an independent review of the Rotharam case published in 2014, Professor Alexis Jay concluded that the majority of known perpetrators were of Pakistani heritage, including five men convicted in 2010. A report in 2017 by a think tank Quillian, authored by two British Pakistanis, showed that more than four out of five men, or 84% of people, convicted of grooming girls for sex are Asian. With cases in multiple cities across the UK. And they don't only target the white British, they also attacked the Hindus in Leicester a couple of years ago, as well as the Jews, which we saw in the pretty virulent anti-Israel protests across the UK. people in these Western countries believe that the extremism within the Muslim community is coddled by the liberals in those countries. Prime example was the deans of the most prestigious universities in America saying that calling for the genocide of Jews does not violate their free speech policies. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. Talking about India, we've seen a very similar trend with the Liberal parties as well. There's a trend of targeting the Hindu community for reform, putting the burden of secularism only on the Hindu community, while leaving the Islamic communities and other minority communities free to do whatever they wish. I gave the example of the personal laws. The Muslim majority state of Jammu and Kashmir was given Article 370 so that the people of that state did not have to adhere by Indian laws. The Hindus had been clamoring for decades 
to get some of their most sacred monuments back, which had been destroyed by Islamic invaders. But the secular parties went out of their way to ensure that the Hindus couldn't get those structures back. Structures like the Ram Mandir and the temples in Kashi and Mathura. Article 29 and 30 of the Indian constitution provides extra rights to minority communities which are not given to the Hindu community, especially when it comes to establishing and managing their own religious and cultural institutions, which means the Islamic community has a massive advantage when it comes to educating their communities, a right which is not provided to Hindu communities. And similarly, in the West, we have seen the rise of critical race theory, of postmodernism, of intersectionality, all of which sees white people as inherently evil, which divides the world into oppressors and the oppressed, sees white people as inherently evil, as the upholders of the patriarchy, and see Muslims as the victims of this patriarchy, despite the fact that there are 50 plus Muslim majority countries in the world where the Muslims openly bully and victimize the minority communities and uphold their archaic patriarchal laws. Arab states have been spending eye-watering amounts of money in US colleges to keep them coddling the Islamic community. A similar thing was said by J.P. Green at the Manhattan Institute. He said that individual donations might not be very much for the university, but they are enough to influence specific departments, particularly the humanities. As a result of that, you have universities saying that there are far too many white people there. BBC radio hosts are saying that there are too many white people in the UK. What the fuck is like saying there are too many Mexicans in Mexico? Or going to China and you're friend asks you, well, how was your Chinese vacation? And they answer, man, it sucked. It was just full of Chinese people. What the hell did you expect? In addition to that, the left, which once stood for free speech, the free discussion of ideas, has now started to use intimidation tactics to stop the discussion of ideas. They cancel people who show even the slightest degree of disagreement with them. Getting canceled is so common now that for many teenagers, it's more of a joke. There was a line at, at a party where a student says, she heard someone say, if you haven't been canceled, you're canceled. <laughs> the problem became so dire over the last few years that even a liberal like Obama had to come out and speak out against cancel culture. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or used the word wrong verb or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because, man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> University professors and beloved authors like J.K. Rowling are getting canceled. A UCLA professor was recently put on leave after, get this, refusing to give non-white students time off for the death of George Floyd. Last month, Evergreen State College in Washington went crazy when a professor of evolutionary biology named Brett Weinstein objected to a day of absence when white students and faculty were asked to voluntarily leave campus. Weinstein branded it a form of racial segregation. A group of student protesters called him a racist. The confrontation incited further protests, debates over free speech, and claims of systemic racism on campus. This tweet that she put out again a year ago offended the transgender community because she said that sex is real. And people across these countries, including India, are rightly upset that the Islamic community gets coddled while the native communities in these countries get attacked. I mean, Muslims have enslaved blacks for longer than the Europeans. Most of you have heard about the transatlantic slave trade, which was horrible. But how many people know about the Arab Muslim slave trade? It was noted as the largest and the longest slave trade, which was action for around 1300 years. And although the exact figures are debated, the total number of Africans enslaved by the Arabs is thought to be around 9 million people. So if you treat Bain like a criminal, but you treat the Joker as a newlywed guy at their in-law's house, Bain is right to think, what the fuck? There are many Muslim countries that have the death penalty against LGBTQ people, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Brunei, Mauritania, Pakistan, Qatar, UAE, and Uganda. You found that a vast majority of Muslim countries had apostasy laws, which means if you try to leave the Islamic religion, you will face heavy punishment. A survey found that Muslims across the globe had views which could not be accepted in the West. Many Muslims supported the Sharia law. Many believe that an atheist cannot be moral. Many believe that a wife must obey her husband totally. Many support killing apostates. Many think homosexuality should be punishable. There has been a significant amount of growing anger within these countries against these policies of the left, but the left seems to be refusing to learn. The UK spends eight million pounds per day to house the migrants in hotels. A similar case with New York City, where the hotels are running out of migrants and their mayor, Eric Adams, is pleading immigrants not to come to New York City because they simply can't house any more people. 
Mayor Eric Adams escalating his frustration during a town hall meeting, revealing new fears as tens of thousands of asylum seekers continue to arrive in New York City. This issue will destroy New York City. The city of LA wants to mandate hotels giving empty rooms to homeless people. And if that wasn't enough, San Francisco was sending alcohol and marijuana to the homeless. I mean, that's kind of cool, man. I mean, that's not homelessness, that's just a good vacation. You and a couple of buddies could just go to San Francisco for a weekend, pretend to be homeless, get some weed, get some alcohol, have a party, and then come back home in time for work. And so because of these reasons, there's starting to be a very significant pushback against these political parties. The election of Modi in 2014 in India was a major marker of a cultural and political shift in India. Soon after that, in 2016, Donald Trump gets elected in America, who made statements like, hey, I think Islam hates us, among other things. We cannot continue to allow thousands upon thousands of people to pour into our country, many of whom have the same thought process as this savage killer. Many of the principles of radical Islam are incompatible with Western values and institutions. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on? Today, in 2024, Trump is again a frontrunner to be the US president and is expected by many people to beat the center-left candidate, Joe Biden. In the UK, the more right-leaning Tories are in power, with Indian origin Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who have also been trying to take strict action on immigration. In June this year, 5,500 people gathered in Tokyo, Japan, against the privilege given to immigrants. They were chanting slogans like, Japan is for Japanese only. <laughs> Netherlands' potential next Prime Minister, Geert Wilders, is also very openly anti-Islam. After I would win the elections, close the Dutch borders for immigrants from Islamic countries immediately. He was one of the only foreign politicians who stood up unapologetically for Nupur Sharma when she was charged with blasphemy and threatened with death threats. His views on his domestic policy in the Netherlands if he comes to power are quite clear. Today in Finland, there is a right-wing government. They have a vocal EU skeptic and immigrant skeptic wing. A right-wing party is the biggest party in Switzerland. The new head of Italy, Giorgia Meloni, is also seen as a right-wing populist. I think that there is a problem of compatibility between the culture Islamica or a certain interpretation of the culture Islamica. Hungary already has a right-wing government. In Ireland, their potentially most famous athlete ever, Conor McGregor, is hinting that he's going to join right-wing politics. The former UFC champion warned in a post on X if the government do not act soon with their plan of action to ensure Ireland's safety, I will. I mean, is this an announcement, Emily, that he's going to enter politics? In Germany, the right-wing AFD is becoming very popular and it's never a good sign when Germany starts to lead right. In the runoff elections on 19th November 2023, Argentinians elected right-wing populist Javier Milei as the country's new president. And of course, completing the circle coming back to India, we have the BJP, who by all accounts seem to return to power for a third time in 2024 with a comfortable majority. And so I think when people blame a rise in hatred for why so-called right-wing political parties are winning elections across the globe, I think they're completely wrong. I'm sure there is a level of hatred in there, but you cannot ignore the other aspects as well. And unless the left-based parties decide to look in the mirror clearly and address the problems they have in their own cohorts, I feel like this trend of right-wing parties winning elections is only going to continue. I want to ask you as well, which country do you think personally is going to be the next country to elect a so-called right-wing government? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you like these kinds of English analytical videos, let me know what topic I should make the video on next. Other than that, guys, great to hang out with you again we will see you for the next one and until then stay healthy stay happy and i'll see you for the next one and to all of you